Assalamualaikum and welcome to tonight's live show on Imam Hussain TV. You may note this week and also last week a number of different centers, mosques, homes have been commemorating the sad martyrdom, the tragic death of Fatima Zahra. Why is it that we always see the same faces in many a majalis? English, Arabic, Farsi, Urdu, and maybe even other languages in the West, and naturally in the East as well. Let's explore the topic of Fatima Zahra Aslam al-Aslam. Why is it that we have notable figures that we actually look up to from a feminist point of view? Mother Teresa, Florence Nightingale, and so on and so forth. With me tonight, inshallah, we have Dr. Sayyid Amar Nakshwani. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Amar Nakshwani. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullah. It's a nice uh, privilege once again to have you here. Uh, on our live show. So the live show tonight is, is going to be discussing the topic of Fatima Zahra, Aslam and Islam. The Lady of the Universe, Sayyidah Nisai Al-Alameen Al-Aslam. So what I want to really start off with is the fact that, first of all, we've got a number of different issues to address and we want to link it, as it were, to the contemporary ideology of what's going on these days, as it were, what we can also look up to in terms of a role model and so on and so forth. But that will come later on. However, um, I'd like to start first of all, what would Fatima Zahra Aslam Aslam think about feminism? What would she approve, if anything, specifically for our sisters, as it were? And what would you have to say about that? First and foremost, condolences to the communities worldwide on the martyrdom of the Lady of Light. And I know that many centers really worked tirelessly in the last couple of months or so to try and ensure that this le lady's legacy continues to be represented worldwide. But you mention a fundamental point, and that is that there are many who may have attended lectures in Arabic or in Farsi or in Urdu or in English, yes. but you tend to be preaching to the converted. Yes. And sadly, there are still many in the world who do not know much about the biography of this lady. And when you ask the question concerning would she approve of feminism today, I think defining feminism and defining why one wants to subscribe to what is seen as an ideology, in some cases a political ideology like feminism, Yes. It's not something that can be defined with looking at one angle. Because originally this movement, the feminist movement, is a movement that realized there were political, social, economic rights, as well as personal rights, which were not being given to women at large. Okay. And still, there are many communities in the Muslim world and the non-Muslim world, where in terms of education, in uh -huh. terms of finance, in terms of marital and domestic issues, there are many women who are treated unjustly. And what you find is that there are a number of different waves of feminism. To describe feminism with only one particular historical angle or one particular anthropological or sociological mm -hmm. angle is not right. No, it would be so Because bad. at different junctures in the development of our society, there have been many voices who have sought to speak out for the rights of women, especially in the face of an arrogant, patriarchal, chauvinistic System. group of males. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
And it doesn't matter whether the state is a religious state or a non-religious state. There will always exist a group I see. who have an arrogant worldview where the way they look at women at large is in a very condescending manner. A manner in which they do not believe that these women can have the same confidence or belief okay. in themselves as men do. Right. The whole idea of the feminist movement is to say that, no, actually, self-belief and confidence is something that God has gifted to male and female. Now, when I say God has gifted, some will say, well, not all feminists believe in God, but the whole central base is that Equality. you should be able to speak out yeah. for your rights, whether it's economic, whether it's political, whether it's social, and that there is this ability gifted to us to be able to have equal rights especially with an islamic thought that spiritually god creates us equal yeah. yes there may be different junctures in the history of society where people may have for example different social roles but even these are open to evolution yeah. you look at for example seventh century arabia you were lucky to find men that were Literate, let and alone women. Yes, yes, yes. In some cases, one may even argue that women were more literate than some of the men. I don't think you can find more than 17, 18 men in Arabian society who were known to be uh, literate. Literate. And so what you have now is that you have in the world today a number of movements where in many cases women have not had it as good as they've had it today. Mm. You know, you'll find that there were times in the history and evolution of, um, of women within the communities around the world where they couldn't go to school, couldn't go to college, couldn't go to university. Yeah, sure. Whereas now it seems that there's more women going to university than there are men. Naturally. And when there were periods where women were simply employed because of a man's sexual preferences or to get promoted, they had to, for example answer certain sexual favors, mm -hmm. the Me Too campaign then emerges. Then there was discrimination and pay gap. Right. And then the gender pay gap issue begins to be discussed. And so what we're seeing as the base of this, even though I know that there are different interpretations, but what we're seeing at the base is that you're seeking to ensure that there is justice, justice. in the way that men and women are treated. Yeah. Yes. If therefore someone asks me, would Fatima al Zahra السلام, be pleased with seeing what's happening with the feminist movement today? Firstly, I'm no one to speak on behalf of the greatest lady in the history of the religion of Islam. But her worldview was a worldview of establishing justice. These are, you know, there's a mystical element to Fatima, and that is the pure light carried from the Abrahamic line. line. You know, those wombs that are never affected by polytheism. Sure, sacred As image. we recite in, in, in the salutations and in the ziyaras that we have. So what you have with her is that justice is fundamental. In Islamic okay. ethics, and this is fundamental when we're looking at, you know, feminism at large, in Islamic ethics, the highest ethic, Islamically, is justice. Right. See, you've got, being truthful is great. Mm -hmm. Being generous is great. They're These are all qualities. very, they're all good qualities. Yeah. But if you're, sometimes telling the truth can also be wrong at certain moments. Yep, absolutely. Now, I know that sounds paradoxical, but there are times where you don't say everything. And even being overly generous can end up spoiling your kids forever. True. But being just is always good. Yes. There's, whenever you are just, it's always good. And so what you have with Fatima Zahra's worldview is a worldview of justice being established. Allah. And recognition that Allah is just. Recognition that the role of the prophets of Allah, peace be upon them, was to establish justice. When God makes the covenant with Abraham, and he said, "Look, the nation, Imam, said, 'How about my offspring? You've mm -hmm. made me an Imam. 
How about my offspring? The oppressors will not be the ones who inherit this covenant. It's the people of justice. justice. So there are elements of the feminist movements where clearly they resonate with Fatima Zahra Salam's worldview. Yeah. No doubt. Okay, Alhamdulillah. Thank you for that uh, deep, uh, meaningful insight. Um, now, you've very eloquently, I must say, um, put together uh, a very good response to um, approval, as it were, of feminism by, you know, the Lady of Light, Sayyidina Nisail Alameen Fatima Zahra Salam Alayhi Salam. Do you think, um, because of a lack of justice, as it were, that women, let's obviously focus on women and obviously naturally sisters in, at large, that there's been a rebellion across, across everywhere, all norms of society. I mean, to give you an example now, or a number of examples, um, there are girls, good girls, good Muslim girls, who have later on taken off their hijab, you know, due to rebellion. Some women say that they should be leaders of the community. So what, how, how does this come together now in terms of feminism and approval and, you know, the encapsulating word rebellion? Because this is quite key. Yes, I, I don't think it's a rebellion as no. such. Right. I think there are a number of key factors which are involved. Okay. Um, you brought up a number of issues. So, for example, when you're, when you're talking about ladies leading the Muslim community... Yeah. Why not? As why it were, not? They, they so so what, what's the issue? Yeah. yeah. If, you know, want, um, if you want justice, yeah, I, it's I, got to be I equitable. I don't see what the issue is. You know, yeah. if, if we want to establish justice and we believe that God has allowed the male and female to reach the same spiritual heights, yeah. the only thing that's going to stop it is our social worldview. And True. in the eyes of... Some women, they'll say that, well, this social worldview is dictated by men. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, obviously, if a man's going to dictate this, he's not going to be wanting the female at the helm. Mm -hmm. Whereas you do find that there are Muslim communities out there where a lady leading the community is not something problematic because men and women can sit together in a committee or in the mosque. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, some will call that rebellious, but those are people who, for example find it difficult to stomach evolution, find it difficult to stomach that times have changed, find it difficult to stomach that... This is your best friend's mother could be somebody who you've respected for years. Now that she's the president of a community, what difference does it make yes. in the way that you've seen her all these years? She's yes. always been someone, you know, of respect, someone who we've admired, you've looked up to, yeah? Yeah, look yeah. up to and so on. Yeah. If you're talking about the hijab area mm. now, there are many different factors why women have taken off their hijab. And it's not just necessarily rebellion. There are some factors, some girls feel that nobody's proposing for them unless they take off their hijab because they feel okay. that there are some guys who either are stipulating that I want a girl with not, who's not wearing hijab or that some guys will not look at them the same way as a girl whose hair is showing, right. naturally recognizing that hair is going to be a fundamental area in, in the way that a person looks at his future wife. And yes, there may be others who, for example, have found arguments. Mm, social factors such as, you know, well, we're not getting right jobs. Right jobs. Promotion. And Others have found that Islamophobia yeah. has yeah, been absolutely. a reason yes. where they fear going on the train or on a bus yeah. because they think to themselves that this could be the end. True. Right. Then there are others who may have looked at certain theological arguments. Okay. Uh, they've looked at certain uh, exegetes of the Quran, certain conclusions on verses, and they've decided that, well, this is contextual and I don't necessarily need to wear a hijab. Right. I don't think Islam has no problem with people who, who seek to find answers on these issues. Right. But you, you, you have to be seeking from the right people. And I'm not saying that women have to be seeking answers from men. This is another area. Okay. There are a number of communities now in the world where there are resident alimas, not just resident yes, alims. Yes. And I'm happy when I hear that there is a resident alima. Right. Because our sisters in many cases don't get to hang around with this lecturer when he's hmm. in town. True. So we can spend late nights with the lecturer. Yes, I yes. know from my own experience that for years where I'd go to lecture, many of the guys would be able to chill with me after I've lectured, whereas with the sisters, they're not going to have that chance. No, and therefore, no. when they've got these questions, there's no one to answer them. True. And I, as well, shouldn't be the one answering them. You know, yeah. there are sisters in our community who are very learned, who've gone and studied at the seminaries. So... This whole idea today that maybe was like, you know, the girls in our community are modern and rebellious and so on. In many cases, there is a base to why they are. 
Yeah. You know, I, I don't think it should be seen as negative because I think Fatima Zahra السلام, and those who she was influenced by, I think they received the same accusations. Right. That they're too loud, they're too rebellious, how dare they? Yeah, yeah. This is not the behavior of a woman. Yes, that's the main criteria, isn't it? That they and, and, and if you do look back yeah. at Fatima, at the life of those who influenced her, then you'll find they, they also were at the forefront of seeking to speak out against injustices. Yes, okay, yeah. thank you for that. Um, with regards to um, world views now, do you think that uh, Fatima Zahra Salam, who influenced her, as it were, her her world view? Well, I think her dad, okay. you know, the, the, the Prophet, peace be upon him, his family, has a major influence on her life. Right. Um, she loves him, he, he equally loves her because yeah. it's as if in Fatima there is not only the continuation of the of the endless bounties mentioned in Surat al kothar Okay. Where remember Fatima's birth is a huge for him because he's lost these sons and yes. people are mocking yes. him Two by saying sons, yeah. Abtar, Abtar, Abtar. Mm. Abtar refers to in Arabic. If an animal's tail was cut, they would call it Abtar. I see. So they're telling the Prophet that your lineage is cut now because you, you don't have any, any sons. Your male sons son, are yeah, male yeah, sons. Yeah. They're, 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 they're dying um, shortly after birth. And, and so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives him Fatima. And when he gives him Fatima, not only is he loving her, not only can he use her as a means of helping the growth of the Muslim community. You know, when they see him standing up for Fatima, that one moment is him telling these arrogant, chauvinistic Arab males that I'm the man who's come with this religion, yet look how important Fatima is. Yes. Look how important women are. Look how important your daughters are, your sisters are, your aunts are. Don't be of those who oppress them and arrogantly treat them mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. And she likewise is influenced by many areas of his life. Right. When she sees, for example, him speaking out against injustice, uh, the injustice of the Arabs in burying the daughters alive, the injustice of the Arabs in terms of inheritance. As a, a, a fundamental example, right. you know, uh, these Arab women could not inherit. No. And the most arrogant Arab would be the one who says that woman cannot inherit. Right. Or those who would conclude that we don't need the witnessing of women. Yeah, yeah. You know, if they saw a woman give witness, they, they'll treat her arrogantly. Or if they, for example, heard that a woman was inheriting, it would bring a particularly distaste to them. And yet the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family, through the medium of the Quran, begins to speak out against these injustices. And when he begins to speak out, Fatima looks at the way he speaks. She sees the way he treats his wife Khadija, her mother. Absolutely. You know, um, and Khadija is that great blessing, of course, in his life. Yet Fatima sees the way he dotes on her, the way he he faces economic sanctions, but she's a pillar for him. Yeah. She becomes a leader for the religion of Islam. To the extent, you know, the famous narration says Islam would not have grown were it not for what? Were it not for the sword of Ali. Mm -hmm. And the wealth of Khadija. Khadija yes. So the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family, has a huge effect on Fatima's worldview from a young age. And I think this is a lesson for all of us. So especially parents out there. Our kids are like a sponge. Right. They'll learn languages quick. They learn concepts quick. They learn certain moral principles quick. We have to make sure that we are the best examples for them. No doubt. Because it's as if when you're looking at the young Fatima, she looks at her mom, she looks at the dad, and she sees just the best example possible. There's, you know, the, the way they interact, the way they are, you know, as husband, as wife, as mom, as dad, spiritually, the beautiful areas of meditation. You know, going to the cave. Yes, yes, together. Together with the young Ali. Yes, yes, yes. Imam Ali salam says in Nahj al I used to follow the Prophet like the, the baby of the she-camel camel. follows its mother, you know. Yeah. And, and, and 
she looks at that wonderful balance that's there. You can be a wife, you can be a good mom, you can be spiritual, you can speak out against injustice. So he has a huge, he has a huge influence on her. Subhanallah, no doubt. subhanallah. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, with respect to feminism, as it were, can it be said that her dear father, the Holy Prophet, uh, peace be on him, and Bibi Khadija Salam were the real first feminists, as it were? Uh, I, I mean... Well, in the way that they spoke out... Just an extension right, yeah. from what we just mentioned. I, 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 think, I think it's not a far-fetched statement. Yeah, I know yeah, people can yeah. debate all day long yeah. that, you know what, feminism, you don't know, understand that every area of feminism is not correlated with Islam. Listen, let's not be around the bush. We, we agree that there are certain areas of feminist thought that are not in line with Islamic thought, but let's work on the principle of seeking... Um, uh, to address certain injustices. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Sayyidah Khadija alayhi salam, nobody spoke out for the rights for women to inherit, the rights for uh, women to live, the True. rights for women to be educated, the rights for women to, be wor to work, like Sayyidah Khadija alayhi salam. Phenomenal personality. Um, and, I, and as I said earlier, I think she has this role which sadly the feminist textbooks or the textbooks in our schools and our colleges in the Muslim and the non-Muslim world. Believe you me, the Muslim world has forgotten Sayyidah Khadija. Yes. The Muslim yes. world has forgotten Sayyidah Khadija. And us forgetting Sayyidah Khadija is part of the reason we have so many calamities. Part right. of the reason that we have so much bala on our community. Saudi, Yemen, this, this, everyone... You're looking around the world and you're seeing poverty and, and crime and people dying in Syria and Iraq. And part of that is because we neglected the bounties that were left for us. We destroyed the grave of the uh, graves of the grandchildren of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. We desecrated the houses of Khadija and others. We forgot these personalities. Mm, the lack of recognition has gone and we're yeah. suffering now. And believe you me, you look at many Muslim households, I guarantee you, their kids do not know much about Sayyidah Khadija. And it's sad. There are many families now, don't even name their daughters Khadija. Believe you me, if you've done a survey, in the last year of daughters' names and Muslim communities, some names are absurd. I won't go to those because I don't know what some of those names means. Like someone just went on Google and wrote cool names and something yeah, popped up and yeah. they just named that. But pillars like Khadija, they changed the course of the way women were treated. True. So when we see Fatima so magnanimous, look at her mother, then you'll know the apple does not fall far from the tree, tree. both metaphorically yeah, and yeah. possibly on the night of Miraj, literally. SubhanAllah, yeah. thank you for that. Um, with moving on to education now, and this is a really, really key fundamental area, as it were, using the pivot of Bibi Fatima, Salaam I find... And I'm sure yourself and other people do as well. It's with great sadness and regret that we find so much being advocated, promoted, spoken of on gender issues and studies, but there's no mention of Sayyidah Fatima Zahra Salaam Alayhi Salaam. Why is that the case? Because, because the thing is, in mm. numerous, mm. how can I say, uh, practical environments, for example, myself, I've studied, I've studied a, a degree. Um, you have various departments, sections named after famous personalities and so on and so forth but yet you know you don't have anything in relation to the fame or the the justice or the ilm the wisdom or the grace of Fatima um, in my introduction I mentioned about you know figures such as Florence Nightingale Mother Teresa and so forth but there's just a lack of you know uh, recognition as it were given to this the greatest woman who's ever graced. What, why is that the case, especially with regards to gender studies, do you think? I think there is a need for us to build a better relationship with the academic world. Okay. There are many of us who either studied, worked, or sent our kids to the academic world. But we need one more step in our relationship. Right. And that is either by talking to the departments okay. of Islamic studies and seeking to establish fellowships, okay. chairs, right. we'll come to that as well, yeah, institutes yeah. named after these glorious personalities. Right. I've seen that there are institutes named after kings of Gulf states. 
I've seen that there are institutes of Islamic studies named after famous figures in Islamic history. But it's sad that you're hard pressed to find an institute or a chair or a fellowship which is named after the Prophet, peace be upon him, yes. and his family. Yes. It's very rare, and if you're going to these prestigious universities, the Ivy Leagues in America, or for example, you go towards the universities in the UK or in Europe, you will not find departments which are named after Imam al Sadiq or Imam al Baqir. Now, someone asks, why would we need to have a chair or a fellowship or scholarships named after them? Yeah. Well, firstly, you are giving a little bit back to what they did for you. You're honoring them, number two, and that's an act of worship. But number three, the world is a better place when people learn about the family of the Prophet. How else are they going to learn? Yeah. And one of the ways they're going to learn yeah. Yeah. is when they hear, for example, the Imam al Sadiq Award mm -hmm. for Scientific Endeavor and Achievement this year goes to. Yes. Because we went to many of our, you know, when we go to the ceremonies of graduation, you hear mm -hmm. that this award and that award and this award and that award, but you never hear the Imam al Rada Award or the Imam al Hadi Award. Yes. Or the Imam al Sadiq Chair of Islamic Studies. Sure, sure. So there is a need for us to speak to these universities. And I hope that every single level of Shi'i authority, from the laity who sits under the mambar, under the pulpit, okay. to those at the top, gather their resources together and approach these big universities. It's not difficult. You can approach them, you talk with them, and you say to them, that how much would it cost, for example, for us to endow okay. a chair? The yeah. way Dyson endowed, the way, for example, the, the Indian government endowed for economics, the mm -hmm. way, for example, mm -hmm. this country and that Gulf country endowed for other areas. We want to endow yes. a chair on gender studies yes. in the name yes. of Father Zahra It will cost us yes. a couple of million pounds, for example. But the amount of wealth and the amount of well-wishers and the amount of generous people we have, believe you me, on a night like this, we could raise it. I, I wouldn't be surprised. We have so many generous people in our communities. But sometimes the evolution and the steps in our uh, direction as a Muslim community, we need to provide it with some sort of guidance. Yeah, yeah. okay, okay. Thank you so much for that. Now, just to put things into perspective and context, as it were, say now, um, I know, and just in relation to what you mentioned about the chair, as it were, um, can you perhaps, I mean, for example, you were very instrumental and very integral, as it were, um, in the Imam Ali chair. So that's the first point I want to inquire about. Second point I want to also ask is about last week that, that you, uh, from my understanding, you attended an event at Cambridge as well. So if you can address that and also what you know, guidance is given to that. So, for example, first point is the Imam Ali chair and also the event at Cambridge. And why is this so integral and instrumental on tonight's topic for Fatima Zahra? It was one of the biggest honors to be able to establish a chair um, named after Imam Ali And I hope that the viewers who are out there listening are the ones who will establish a chair named after Fatima Zahra. Inshallah. Um, the hard work of uh, Professor Mahmoud Ayyub and the Imam Ali Foundation, the Universal Muslim Association of America, the World Federation, okay, um, you know the and others who had contributed generous, generous donors in the Muslim community, okay, um, especially in North America who had generate who had generously donated to help us establish the Imam Ali chair, okay, because many of us had felt that hold on a minute, Imam Ali alayhi salam is known in our mosques. Mm. He's loved by Muslims worldwide, yes. irrespective of whether you're Shia, you're Sunni, you all love Imam Ali Islam. But why is there no chair named after him? Yeah. Yeah. A man of philosophy, a man of mysticism, a man of spirituality, a man of ethics, a man of law. The list goes on. And the list goes on. Oh, no. And yet you find that there, are, there were no chairs. 
We were busy building mosques and mashallah, we've done great building mosques. We have built mosques and it's quite sad, as you mentioned uh, earlier on, you alluded to the fact that, you know, we have certain figures um, who may be known, maybe unknown in the West. I find it personally quite sad that, you know, you have mosques named after certain people that are modern day figures we don't even know about. Yep. So yep. It's, it's, it's quite strange that, and you're quite right, I think, that... Uh, you know, and again, it goes back to the credence and lack of recognition and who these noble characters were. And people you know, can go and, online and, if they want. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, if, they, if you go on Google, you type Imam Ali Chair of Shia studies and dialogue amongst Muslim legal schools. Okay. First aim is to ensure that Imam Ali's name was there. It's at the Hartford Seminary in Connecticut, um, USA. You'll find the Imam Ali chair being established there. It cost us one and a half million dollars. Okay, okay. And alhamdulillah, you know, I was the inaugural holder of the chair. Mm -hmm. um, then you have Dr. Saif al-Din Kara. And, um, you know, all have given a service over there where we were able to have some of the best seminars with renowned speakers. And we thank God now that and I, you know, I can announce to everybody publicly that um, we're going to have a fellowship uh, with the Wolf Institute at Cambridge University named after Lady Khadija alayhi salam. You know, um, the Hikma Foundation has worked okay. tirelessly okay. Um, to try and ensure that this happened. And so it was the Hikma Foundation alongside, you know, the Wolf Institute at Cambridge last week. And can people read up on this? Yes, you can read up. Yeah. You know, if you just, yeah. um, you know, last week's event was a wonderful event. We have another event at Cambridge University discussing okay. the life of Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam. salam. And that's March the 4th. Okay. Um, in conjunction with, you know, with, uh, the, with the Wolf Institute, uh, which seeks to bring interfaith dialogue between Muslims, Christians and the Jewish community. So... That type of work is where I hope we're heading. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And I know that there are many who watch these shows who may turn around and say that, listen, I have a million, two million, five million spare. Let's sure. establish something soon. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Now, just staying on that same area of chair, as yeah. it were, and the importance of, you know, um, bringing to, to, to light these figures, as it were, who in many circles have been forgotten, as you mentioned, you know, the lack of names that many sisters or girls are named after Bibi Khadija, salam alayhi salam. Many people haven't heard about these great notable personalities. Just staying on that topic, do you think, what do you think has been more valuable, as it were? Um, a chair or an institute, as it were? And, and that's specific to the Lady of Light, Fatima Zahra, salam alayhi salam. This is quite important because... What do you think are the dynamics, as it were, around that? Is there um, a difference? I, I, I think if you're able to have a chair, what you know, in the UK you call it a professorship, and okay. in America it's called a chair. Right. Um, and look, across the board on Shia studies at the moment, there's great work being done. You know, there's um, there's work being done at Exeter, there's work being mm. done at Leiden, there's okay. you know, there's work being done at Birmingham, there's work being done Holloway, Lancaster. Uh, so as had a on Shiaism. So there's there's great work on Shi'i studies. I think a chair of professorship is is a great you know great uh, position to have for us. But I think an institute is ultimately what we should aim for. An okay. institute, unlike a chair where you may have a professor with a with a research or a secretary assistant, mm -hmm. I think with an institute you can have four, five, six faculty. You can have researchers as Shalla. well. Um, and I do hope that an institute of Shia studies named after Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam yeah, will go a long way to ensuring that people know about Fatima in gender studies. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, viewers, we could be going in for a short break in the next few minutes. But however, just before we do, uh, say now I want to ask you a question. Um, Aisha seems to be mentioned continuously more in gender studies. Um, courses, content, programs, as it were, and also by feminists. Why do you think this is the case? And this is quite key, as it were, you know. I think there, there's a number of reasons right. why. Um, I think, firstly, if you're looking at her influence after the Prophet, peace be upon him, his family dies, uh, Aisha has a huge influence. And, you know, in, in 
in Sunni thought, she is seen as virtually half the religion. Um, after the Prophet, peace be upon his family, dies, you want to get knowledge, you go towards her. Yeah. Uh, so there is that influence. See, Khadija and Fatima are more revered in Sunni thought because of association rather than because of merit. Mm -hmm. Secondly, I think Aisha raising a war against Amir al muminin you know, against yes. Imam Ali, the famous Battle of the Camel, yeah. Battle of Jamal. I think for many in gender studies, for many in feminism, they see that as the as the ideal. You know, I've always said okay. that anyone who says that um, that Islam is a religion that oppresses women, how, come and have a look at Aisha at Jamal. There's no oppression of women there. There's a woman who's telling men how to fight and yeah. you know what yeah. to fight, when yeah. to fight. I think in the in the paradigm of feminist thought, okay. that's a that's a role model because that is someone True. Yeah. showing yeah. that um, her could, example, her you know, fight Ali. There's no issue. Does not matter Ali, his position with the Prophet peace be upon his family, his position in terms of the narrations, his position in the incident of the cloak, his position in the incident of Mubahla, his position at Badr Uhud Khanda Khaybar. I'll fight him. And I am a woman, but this is a time where men cannot dominate. I can dominate and I can raise an army. And I think that I remember once um, sitting, having dinner mm -hmm. in, um, in Washington, D.C. And the waitress overheard me and my friend speaking and, and she, she recognized that we might have a bit of Islamic knowledge. Okay. And uh, and then she said, you know, my role model is Aisha. I love studying Aisha. And I asked her why. And she said, because she, you know, she gave you that, that lesson that you can lead men. Men don't lead you. And you can fight anyone in the way that she fought Ali at yeah. the Battle of the Camel. So gender studies, when it, when it looks at Islamic studies and feminist theories, when they look at Islamic studies, this is a huge figure. Right. Um, with Fatima, alayhi salam, Fatima Zahra, the way they look at her is, well, it's quite a negative depiction academically. You know, this lady is quite emotional. Her dad died. She gets emotional. But we have to love her because she's the Prophet Muhammad's wife. And they really reduce her. Um... But the reality is, I think, who Fatima stood up against is why she's reduced. Yeah. And um, had she stood up against anyone else, I think there'd be more people admiring Fatima. But uh, who she stood up against is probably the reason that she had to be hidden from the annals of history and yeah. the, the way yeah. Aisha was. Allah knows born. best. Yeah. Okay, okay. Viewers, we will be going to a break very shortly. Um, do call in for your questions. The telephone number is 0203 515 You can also WhatsApp your messages. And also, I do urge, if you can, please promote the channel uh, for shows by donating generously. Um, it would be very helpful as well to promote shows and have distinguished and excellent, superb guests, and, uh, such as Dr. Sid Amar Nakshwani. Dr. Sid. Amar, we'll come back in the next couple of minutes. Just want to put uh, food for thought, as it were, what we're going to follow up with. Um, so we'll come back with this question, inshallah. Um, how would you or should we construct a Fatima salam alayhi worldview on feminism? So we'll come back just after the break on that point. Okay, so see you very shortly. Asalaamu As alaikum. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to tonight's live show on Imam Hussein TV. 
With me tonight, we have Dr. Sayyid Amar Nakshwani. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as um, Just before we continue, I'd like to thank everyone for watching the live show tonight and also previously from our honored guest, uh, Dr. Sayyid Amar Nakshwani. Uh, do continue watching. Do also please promote the show and the channel. And if you can also um, pass the message around and also donate generously. The telephone number once again is 0203. 5150199. So now, um, just prior to the break, I just posed a, a short point to ponder on um, in terms of how would you or should we, as it were, construct um, a view, as it were, from Fatima Zaslam on feminism? It, 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 can there be one, as it were? Well, I think there are stages in her life. Mm. We've spoken which... about, sorry, about, you know, how she took. Uh, grace and admiration and that sort of um, molding, as it were, from her parents. So just extending that now forward. Yeah, there, there, there's a unique understanding of Fatima, alayhi salam, when you're looking from the angle of her as a wife, her as a mother, mm -hmm. the spiritual Fatima and the political Fatima. Right. These are areas where some feminists may turn around and say, for example, today you hear these things being said by some, that, you know, no need for me to be married. I can, independence yeah. is, without, you know, is without any man in my life. I don't need a man in my life. I don't need kids in my life, you know. There are some who go to an extent where they say, like, the dog, for example, at home is their kid. And they'll dote on their dog, and their dog is everything for them. And they'll admit that this is my child. And then there are certain feminist movements which, for example, don't see a need for a god, don't see a need for like a spiritual way as such. Mm -hmm. It's more of a focus that if we can get our rights back, then after that, you know, everybody can live as free as they want. And then you have an area where there is a lot of correlation. And that is the politically outspoken Fatima. Okay. Uh, but I think what's unique in the paradigm that you can build with Fatima, alayhi salam, is the areas of mother, you know, wife, mother, spiritual, mm. that, you know, fight, fight for your rights. Yeah, yeah. But don't look at these as taking away your independence or your freedom or making you unhappy. On the contrary, even these you can make divine. Yeah. yeah. You know, so for example, when we're looking at the area of being a wife, you'll find that there are even some in our communities today who'll say that, I don't want to get married. And you say, but you're at the age for marriage. No, I don't want to get married. Don't want to get married. Don't want to get married. Don't want to get Fatima sees... Alayhi salam, no issue in her getting married at a young age. Of course, cultures differ hmm. today and yes. there are different sure. um, understandings morally of what's allowed, what's not allowed. But she gets married at a young age. She wants to get married. It's not just that the family is forcing her. Yeah, there are people proposing for Fatima. But she wants to get married. She's got the rights, of course, to choose who she wants to be with. And she's very happy to know that she's going to be with this husband in his early 20s. A guy she gets to really know in Mecca and especially on the night of Hijrah when he is ready to sacrifice everything for his, for his prophets and for his lords. And she's you know, enamored by him um, and, and what he does. So what you've got on the one angle is this, this person who doesn't find marriage a hindrance to her growth. Right. Uh, but then, not just marriage, she, she's happy to be this wife who's behind the scenes, even though she could easily say that, do you know whose daughter I am? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm the daughter of the most important man you'll ever know. But it's okay. You know, I, I don't find it a problem if my husband is the enough. lead. Look, there are some real nasty husbands out there and I don't want sure. to look at the examples of people like that because they, they've ruined you know the image completely but I think at the same time there can be an exaggeration of victimhood um, and we do have to be careful yeah, you know yeah, I, sure. I, I'm yeah. not going to deny that there are you know some nasty piece of work out there but at the same time 
she looks at Imam Ali alayhi salam, she's ready to be there at the battle of Uhud. Where others may have been complaining that, you know, where's my Maldives honeymoon? Or why didn't you book the best hotel in Dubai? And, you know, people have got the rights to, to want the best of everything. Her honeymoon was Uhud. Yes. And she finds pleasure in treating the wounds of her husband on the day of Uhud. She makes this marriage wife conundrum seem divine, not a chore. Mm, mm. There is a, a, there's this, it's, it's beautiful. And I know that there may be people out there who are like, this is all archaic. No, yeah, 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 there are yeah. still ladies who pride themselves. Absolutely. Um, of Absolutely. having their man come home. And literally it's a case of come home because, you know, she's, she's not going out necessarily to work. She's happy to be at home, happy to be waiting for her man. Not ever wanting to annoy him, you know, to the extent I remember when she dies, you know, just before she dies, she says, has there ever been a day that I hurt you yeah, or annoyed yeah. you? You know, yes. if there's been anything, tell words. me. Famous line of hers. <clears throat> so there's this beautiful construction of Fatima the wife. Where some may have a feminist ideology today that, you know, why should I listen to him? Why should I obey? It's not obligatory. It's not, well, don't look at it in that way. Look at it as a growth for the betterment of both your relationships spiritually. But then there's this also yearning to be a mum. And I, right. think, I think some who maybe missed the boat because their reasoning was that I, I, I for example, want to fight for the rights of womankind out there, which I think is a great cause. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then there are others who said that I don't need a man in my life, reached a stage where there was a, a sense of I'm missing something without having a child. Yeah, yeah. Fatima yeah. loves kids. She wants kids. She finds the rearing of kids as not an impediment, but rather, again, as something divine. Right. She wants to talk with them about the Quranic verses that are being revealed day by day. She is honored by her Lord when her kids are under the cloak in the mm -hmm. famous incident of the cloak. Yes, a real mystical moment sure. which no wife sure. or daughter of the Prophet Muhammad can ever claim to have had except her. Yeah. Um Salama wants it, but it's told you are good, this is reserved for Fatima. She loves being around Hassan and Hussein. Some look at it and say, you know, if you get married and have kids, that's the end of your life. For Fatima, there's a sparkle in her eyes, having her kids all around her. You know, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a beautiful moment for her sitting and talking with them. And then you've got this third angle of the fem Fatima feminist possible reconstruction, and that is the spiritual Fatima. You know, there are some feminist movement today, I don't need God, yeah. you know, I don't need religion, religion's archaic, religion produces a man dominate. And I, I don't deny there are some cultures where because of religion that has happened. Yeah. But the spiritual Fatima is unique. There's supplications from Fatima, there's that meditation and reflection that she learns from her mother and father's relationship, uh, which allows that mystical tasbih of Zahra that's still so, in the life of so many of us. Yeah, and which, some Muslims probably don't even know where it actually originated yeah, 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 from. Yeah, there'll be Muslims out there who after their prayers will We'll do tasbih 33 times, subhanallah, 33 times, alhamdulillah, 34 times, allahu akbar. And you ask them, what is that? None of them know the origin is the rosary bead. And there's this lovely, lovely um, relationship between Mary and Fatima. Okay. Mary the infallible, Fatima the infallible, Mary the virgin birth, Fatima the human virgin. Mary's son is to save mankind. Fatima's son virtually does save mankind. Mary is the lady of the rosary, be it Fatima is the lady of the rosary. SubhanAllah. So there's that mystical edge to a Fatima, but put that aside, there's a spiritual Fatima. Yeah. Her relationship with God is not a hindrance. It's not you people are, are, are talking myths. Her relationship with God is beautiful. But I think the last area... Yes. is the one many feminists can relate to okay. more than anything. And that is, I'll stand up against the male dominance of the time. Yes. I'll stand up for economic rights, political rights, social rights. And 
boy does she stand up. Yeah, subhanallah, yeah. subhanallah, thank you for that. We'll come to the political uh, side and then we'll give it some depth, as it were, and some substance um, later on. Um, but just um, just in relation to her being a, uh, oh, naturally the wife of Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abdi Ali al Islam. Um, sure, I mean, some feminists might say, well, it's not really an alignment, as it were, with the feminine paradigm. You know, she's just well, she's just submissive. So, what what do you have to say about that? When and, got, and, and, well, when you've got such a wonderful husband, yeah, and a husband who's willing to share duties with you, um, not arrogantly looking down at you, you know, it's not about looking at it as submissive. She loves the man. Mm -hmm. and when you love someone, you're willing to do anything for them. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, just in terms of touching a bit more on the spiritual side, as it were, um, aspects, um, you've mentioned about, you know, various schools of feminism, because there's not one, there's many, okay? There's, every one of them is seeking something, some sort of form of freedom, as it were. Um, but what lessons, what, I mean, feminism lacks or omits, um, Lessons, as it were, from Fatima Zadda. What can, what can, for example, we give to the feminists? For example, if they say, "Well, we don't believe in a god," and and the movement around that, what what aspects can we take from a spiritually from Fatima Zadda? Yeah, the, the lack of a belief in a god mm. does hinder the feminist worldview for Muslims, for example, because it's all well and good speaking out for political rights and social rights, but social rights and what you view as social rights mm -hmm. may differ. You know, for example, some may be pro-abortion. And while Islam allows abortion in certain cases, you know, um, it certainly shouldn't be willy-nilly free as anyone wants to abort. Um, and there may be other areas which they believe everybody should have the freedom to choose and to live their lives, and Islam may differ on certain areas. And I, I, I do believe that what Fatima Zahra salam, has, Fatima Zahra has something beautiful in her relation with her Lord that is as if it's the icing on the cake of the whole speaking for justice and against injustice. Okay. That there is, <clears throat> I'm doing this with the intention of getting closer to the Lord, to yeah. looking after the creation of the Lord. And this is huge for her because in, in her night prayers, okay. she, she never misses the night prayer. She loves being awake in the night. Right. Her, her kids are used to seeing her on the prayer mat in the night. And then when you've got, you know, her care for community is because of her love for her Lord. Anyone who loves the Lord will care about the community. I remember Imam Ali alayhi salam sees the Christian begging and he's like, it doesn't say who's this. It's like, what's this? How did we reach a stage where this Christian's begging? Yes, yes. Because of his love for his Lord, he could not bear to see another human being hurt. And so Fatima continuously is praying for others in the community. Right. So right. having a relationship with God, this is a key point. Many people out there will turn around and say, I don't need God to be good. I don't deny that. Okay. But would you lose if you have a relationship with God? If, if I observe what my Lord has asked me to observe, helping the poor, helping the orphans, speaking out against injustice, giving charity, being obedient to my parents, acknowledging the elders, uh, you know, then what have I lost? And that's the beauty in Fatima's worldview, that her relationship with God is not a hindrance to her growth. Yes, 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 alhamdulillah. Thank you for that. We'll come to... Um, the political side in a moment or two, but I just want to add that you know you have notable characters such as, for example, Bibi Fidda Salam mm. I'm learning so much from the mystical side of Bibi mm. Fatima Salam Salam. You know, memorization of the Holy Quran and you know uh, the adab and the akhlaq as it were shown to people in the house, but also outside as well. So the list can go on as well. Of course. Yes. Um, now. We're going to give this last section now some context and some substance, as it were. We, I think we've got about 20 minutes or so. So let's uh, dwell into the political aspects, as it were. Um, clearly say, now, after the death of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, um, you know, certain confirmed, undoubted, undeniable sad episodes took place. Um, 
we're not going to go deep into, for example, um, Sakifa and so on and so forth. But for example, many feminists wanted rights. And you can see from her biography and in history, Fatima Zahra, salam alayhi salam, she grew immensely after the death of her politically. We'll come to the other sides of the, what the political episodes were, but how did she actually start growing? Now, this is just the lead up, as it were, to all the events you know, leading up. What Fatima, Fatima, after her, her father's death, the Prophet, peace be upon his family, is normally portrayed as this lady who's crying for her dad. People always will narrate in non-Shia circles mm -hmm. that her father tells her that I'm going to die. She gets emotional. But then he tells her, you're going to be the first to join me. Right. And then she smiles. Okay. And then we're told that Fatima dies shortly after her father dies, some say six months and so on. Okay. Sahih al-Bukhari mentions, <laughs> interestingly, a clear problem right. that occurs between Fatima alayhi salam and the first caliph. Okay. There's a problem. And it's undeniable. It's there. No, no. Nobody can deny this, and there's no Jewish Yemeni guy called Abdullah bin Saba causing this. Um, there's a problem. What's the problem? Because Fatima's pleasure is the pleasure of Allah. Whatever angers Fatima, yes, angers... Yes, uh, I mean, just as uh, Allah. famous words, as, as it were, uh, what did the... Uh, you know, for example, the Holy Prophet left such profound words, um, which I want to read, as it were. Um, Fatima is a part of me. Whoever angers her, angers me. And whoever angers me, angers God. So it, it's really... I mean, one should actually read this... Because Many a time. when you're Many saying that, that, that means any dispute that occurs is not a personal, mundane yeah. issue. Yeah. Because if the Prophet is saying, Fatima bada'atun minni, man adaha faqad adhani. Fatima is a part of me, whoever angers her, angers me. And I love how, you know, uh, there are later versions of this that this is about Ali angering her when he wants to propose for Abu Jahl's daughter. Any, any attempt to try and distance away from what's clear. There's an yeah. issue where she begins to speak out in the way her mom and dad spoke out against the lack of economic or property or social rights for women earlier. She now witnesses that there is a piece of land by the name of Fedak. Right. Given to her by her father after the Battle of Khaybar. As a gift, yes? As a gift. Right. And the first Khalifa narrates a narration, which he himself is the only one who narrates, and people go back to him for it. Prophets don't leave behind inheritance. Right. If any feminist out, out there wants to see the greatest moment of speaking out against the male-dominated hierarchy mm -hmm. for one's property and economics and social rights. Look at Fatima in her sermon speaking out against the authority of the time. Using the Quran to say did not Suleiman inherit from Dawood. Now someone can bring me arguments all day long about Suleiman and what he inherited from Dawood. Well, I, You've got guts to say you have more knowledge of, or you have more of an understanding of the meaning of this verse than Fatima. Or that Yahya inherits from Zakaria. You can give me as many interpretations as you want. Are you saying that you understood this verse more than the lady who the Prophet said is a part of me? Part of me doesn't mean that she's just my daughter. The continuation of a, a, a knowledge which flows from the Prophet, peace be upon his family, to Fatima, to Hassan, Hussein, and so on. Yes, yes. And she's adamant that if speaking out is going to result in her losing her life. There are feminists out there who lost their lives 
speaking out against some of the most arrogant societies who wouldn't allow ladies to inherit, who wouldn't allow ladies to go mm -hmm. to university, who wouldn't allow ladies to uh, have rights domestically or on an economic or social level. Yeah. yeah. And she loses her life because of speaking out vehemently that everybody else inherits from their father, but you're saying that I don't? Have we returned back to the days of ignorance? 23 years earlier, women were buried alive. Babies were buried alive. Mm -hmm. 23 years later, Fatima shaking Medina. Yes. Ask anyone out there, go to Sahih al-Bukhari, type Fatima and type the word Fadak, F-A-D-A-K. Yes. And the beauty of this whole incident is that Fatima is no longer, I am Fatima, you should like me because I'm your prophet's daughter. No, 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 no. 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 It's not about bias. You should like me because I am Ali's wife. No. I know this Quran inside out. My husband is the most learned person in the religion of Islam after my father died. We are not just some Arab random nomad family that converted to the religion a few years ago. We are the descendants of Abraham. In your durood, you say, Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi kama sallayta ala Ibrahim wa ala alihi. Now, when we're doing this, we're making a point clear. That point is that Fatima Zahra salam highlighted her knowledge and her spirituality. And her pleasure is the pleasure of Allah. And whoever angers her, angers Allah. There's no Yemeni Jew to blame it on now. Right. Other incidents we found a Yemeni Jew and we said it's his fault. Yeah. Not this one. No. Because this one, the daughter of the Prophet, peace be upon his family, who until today, by the way, maybe the viewers, some viewers may not know, until today, we don't know where she's buried. Yeah. Yes. yes. Where's she buried? Someone once said to me, yeah, but ladies used to die young at that time. Her mom certainly wasn't young when she died. Was she, she buried? Even she died young. Yeah. Oh, you know what? She died, but she forgave everyone. Well, I want to be buried secretly if you've forgiven everyone. That's the beauty of Fatima. She just highlighted, I don't care if there are men dominating. Injustice is injustice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. Um, the... It's a very tragic episode, as it were, of her death. And you've mentioned about Fadak and its importance for the benefit of the viewers and also a timely reminder. Um, but what are the circumstances around the door itself, the door falling? <clears throat> yeah, this is uh, a Shia, I believe. Okay. A Shia, I believe that. Uh, that she was a martyr. Um, other schools in Islam recognize that there's an issue between Fatima and the first two caliphs. Okay. That's clearly an issue. Uh, they do seek forgiveness. Uh, they do seek to come and talk to her according to the narrations of other schools in Islam. That's clearly an issue. In Shia narratives, and what was clearly a belief in early Shiite communities, judging by the earliest texts, irrespective of questions concerning, you know, 100% authenticity of these texts, there is clearly an early Kufan Shiite okay. belief that Fatima dies as a martyr. Um, and so, yeah, you can find this within Shiite circles. Other schools in Islam recognize that, yes, clearly when she dies... There are two figures she has no relation with whatsoever. Okay, we have a question. Um, it's not quite on the topic, but uh, I'll uh, still read it out for you. What's Islam's view on force or pressured marriage? What should one do in this hopeless situation? So it could be someone that 
It's this is this is this question is one of the reasons why feminist movements started off. Started off because you're seeing that ladies are forced to marry men they 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 can't stand, or yeah. they're forced to marry a cousin who they have no love for, no relationship with. Yeah, it's so sad. And and the best examples that will prophet peace be upon him is family that he tells his daughter Fatima, this person's come and propose. You want him? It's up to you. Until eventually she wants to marry Ali. So this is who we follow mm -hmm. when it comes to. Um, proposals and marriage. Right, okay, there's yeah. another qu question. Um, okay. Um, why can't women become witnesses for a nikah or read a nikah? That's a good question. You don't need okay. witnesses for a nikah. Okay. And you need witnesses for divorce in Shia law. Okay. And in terms of reading nikah, of course she can read her nikah. There's no right. issue. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, you know, whoever has put that question, um, You've now got the answer for that, so women can read uh, Nika, as it were. Um, just, we're going to come to the sort of later aspects, as it were, of the actual night of burial right at the end. But just before we do, let's just focus on um, her daughter, Bibi Zainab, salam alayhi wa salam. What, um, what she learned from her great mother. Um, and did she have a similar worldview? And that's quite key as well, because dynamically it's changing now, isn't it? From the mother now to daughter, and it's slightly different times naturally. But, you know... Zainab, alayhi salam... Is and we'll come to her political stance as yeah, well. Yeah, it's usually influenced by her mother. Yeah. Um, if you're looking at certain tales, they may be hagiographical, but there are tales of her mother telling her there'll be a day where your brother is alone and... And you're going to have to give him the shirt from me. And so her mother, as if her mother recognizes that she's going to face a difficult um, future. Mm -hmm. But it's very similar. Zainab wants to get married young. Zainab okay. loves her, her kids. There's a real spiritual Zainab. And there is the political Zainab. So there's a great reflection between Fatima Zahra and Zainab. Um, and that can be seen in Karbala, Kufa and Sham. Right. You know, so she's married to Abdullah bin Jafar. They have mm -hmm. these wonderful kids. They have a, very, a great relationship with each other. She's known to be giving tafsir of the Quran, known to give lectures to ladies. So she, she doesn't find it an impediment that she's married, but she can still give back to the community. Uh, but once again, Zainab versus Yazid, it's, uh, it's a huge moment in Islamic yeah, history. We'll Come to that. The okay. granddaughter of the Prophet, peace be upon his family, versus the grandson of Abu Sufyan. Sufyan. If ever you wanted to see where Islam went, that was the best moment for you to know where it went. Yeah. 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 Um, viewers, we have just under 10 minutes, um, so do call in if you have any questions. Telephone number is 0203 515 You can also text your questions via WhatsApp as well. Sina, um, just that just nicely leads up to the, the point of... Um, Sayyidah Zainab Salaamu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Salaam. She faces a male patriarch, as it were, known as Yazid. Um, so, I mean, she's, she's facing, facing him. Um, and integrating today's subject matter, could, couldn't one say that Aisha, Fatima, Zayda, Salaamu Alaihi Wa Salaam, and Zainab Salaamu Alaihi Wa Salaam will all be great models uh, for fighting male dominance? No, I mean, uh, let's, let's and you know, in Arabic we say they're all the examples today. Yeah, in Arabic we say such a such a statement. Aisha, Fatima, Zainab are all great role models for fighting male dominance. In Arabic we say kalimat haq yurad biha batil. It seems like a truthful statement. Intention can sometimes be devious. Mm -hmm. There is a huge difference between um, who Fatima and Zainab were standing up against. And when Fatima and Zainab stand up, that is the standing up of the Prophet, peace be upon his family. Okay. That's a continuation of the prophetic line. Right. Whereas with Aisha, she stood up against Ali. Yeah. Now, when people stood up against the first Khalifa and did not pay zakat, and they called it the Riddah Wars, and they said that there were people who were claiming that they were prophets and they have to be killed but there were also people who wouldn't pay zakat to the first caliph and they were killed they wouldn't pledge allegiance to him they were killed so how, how is it that when you rise against the first caliph you have to be killed but when you rise against the fourth you throw the yemeni jew into the mix which really is is a laugh you know they're, they're working their socks off now to try and prove you know um 
It's all the Yemeni Jews' fault, Abdullah bin Saba. No, I think, I think the Prophet Muhammad's companions had issues with each other during yeah. his lifetime. You know, yes. um, one of the reasons given for Ghadir and Man Kuntum Awlah um, away from the Shia interpretation is that Ali and Khalid have an issue. You know, if you've got an issue in the time of the Prophet, I don't know how you're going to survive with each other afterwards. <laughs> and I think Khalid's behavior with Fatima proved that there was never going to be a survival. So what you have there um, is that this cannot be compared in terms of fighting Ali is fighting the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family. Uh, Ali is with the truth and the truth is with Ali. And that really is our slogan Till the day we die. Yes, you know, yes. um, if somebody can find me a way better than Ali, I'll yes, follow it. it which was the words of Kumail bin Ziyad right. to Hajjaj bin Yusuf al thaqafi Kumail said to Hajjaj just before Kumail was being killed, that he said, show me a way better than Abu Turab. You know, is there a way better than Abu Turab? Anyone who fights Abu Turab, we can never, ever... Um, accept. Yes, yeah. okay. Um, so now we just have about six or seven minutes and uh, very briefly I'm going to put forward the two questions that are going to be coming up now towards you. So we're going to be speaking about the night of her burial, the Grand Lady Fatima and also just immediately after that the literary works and obviously feel free to choose which order you want to do. So um, if you can just really elaborate on the night of her burial because we only have about f less than five minutes actually so we've got to um, sum up exactly you know what happened and why it was so important um, you know the night of her burial yeah, yeah. Fatima alayhi salam and Imam Ali alayhi salam are both buried secretly in the middle of the night uh, they don't have public funerals she orders that she does not. She wants to be buried secretly. She doesn't want people to attend her funeral. And the only ones who are allowed to attend are really close, close companions. You know, the likes of Abu Dhar, for example, or Salman. And very, very close companions of the Ahlul Bayt, Ali okay. Um And they bury her secretly in a location that none of us will ever know about. Very difficult for the Imam, Amir al Salam, And he now has four orphans at home. Yes. And we do have these narrations about him seeing her in his dream. But, you know, he really breaks down when he buries her. And it's amazing. This is Ali, the lion of Khaybar. But her death takes its toll. I think years later, two incidents highlight to me just how much he adored her. Okay. And one is... He, he talks to one of his governors, if I'm not mistaken, the governor of Basra in Nahj al and tells him that he's trying to warn him about don't usurp money, don't usurp funds, don't be a crook. <coughs> and he tells him that me and Fatima, all we had was Fedak. And even that they took. And also Umm al banin when she changes her name, because she noticed that he gets emotional when he hears the name Fatima. So it was a really emotional night for him. If you read some of his words, some of his poetry in burying her, he breaks down. Ali is... You know, this is Amir al-Mu'mineen, <sighs> Imam al-Muttaqeen, Sayyid al-Wasriyeen, Asadullah al -Ghal. You know, and yet he, he really breaks down. So, yeah, that's, that's for the night of the burial. It's extremely difficult for him. Okay, okay. The final um, question for tonight is, um, um, she, Fatima al-Zahra, she's known as one of the four women of paradise. Um, but so little written about her. Um, what can we say about this? And also, just as a final point, can you recommend any few, or any literary works, as it were, that are famous? So this is the last point, as it were, for tonight's show. Uh, Father Christopher Clohesi. Okay. Of the Pontifical Institute of Arabic and Islamic Studies in Rome. If you type Christopher Clohesi on Amazon, he has written Fatima, daughter of Muhammad, the book on, on Fatima Zahra alayhi salam. And I would recommend everybody okay. to try and get hold of that book. In London, in a couple of weeks' time, we're going to have a couple of book launches. Inshallah. In South London, at the Haider Islamic Center, North London, Stanmore Mosque. Also at Cambridge on March the 4th. Okay. So sure. that early March period, the father, 
from Rome will come and talk about why he wrote a book on Fatima. And please, those of you who are in the UK, join us. That Shana. weekend, Friday, Saturday and Monday in London as well as in Cambridge to launch the book on Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam. And it's a huge honor for us to have a priest father from Rome writing about Fatima. And even when you listen to him talk about Fatima, he highlights to you that people like Fatima and Ali are not limited to Islam, unlike others who surrounded the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, who will only be admired by Muslims. You will never see admiration or poetry or, or works about them yes, by yes. non-Muslims. But with Imam Ali alayhi salam, with Fatima Zahra alayhi salam, you'll find Christians adoring them, Hindus loving them. You know, many have written works on them because they transcend the Arab nomad pagan riffraff that surrounded the early days. Beyond humanity. Yeah. So, Father Christopher Cloessi, um, as I said, the first weekend in March. Okay. Uh, he will be uh, launching his book on Fatima Zahra Okay. Yeah. Uh, viewers, we've run out of time. It's been a great pleasure to have Dr. Sayyid Amman Akshwani on the show tonight. Um, unfortunately, as I said, we have run out of time. I wish we could have extended the show a little bit longer. But uh, from Dr. Sayyid Amman Akshwani and myself, Muhammad Ali, see you next time. Assalamu alaikum. Mm -hmm.